Welcome back. Now that we've completed the mechanics of playing the game, and two people could actually play this game with a certain amount of enjoyment, it's more fun to play against the computer and to pit your intelligence against the intelligence of the AI. We're now going to create a very simple AI for picking our next move. And I use the term AI or artificial intelligence with a wink and a nod. This is actually going to be more of a heuristic. How do we choose our next move? And we're going to do the simplest possible thing we can do, which is we're going to scan the board looking for an empty square. And if that square is empty, that's going to be our move. It's not very intelligent, but it will demonstrate the switching of the move between the user and the computer. And once we get that much working, then we'll come back and make it smarter. Here's our logic to get the next move. Again, like we did with rules, we have a separate class just for logic. We pass in the board and we pass in the rules that this game is based on. We call the get next move method, which iterates over each row and column. It gets the cell from the board. And if that cell is empty, it returns this row and column immediately. Otherwise, it returns null, meaning that there, there are no moves for this player. Back in our game, this piece down here, we had the, if the turn was human, then we would do the human's move. Otherwise, we would let the user move. Now what we're going to do is instead, we're going to say, call next, get next move with computer as the person we're getting the move for and human as the other. And we'll come back to that later. If there is a move, then we create an O, and then we tell the board to position the O there, and then uh, we return the control back to the human. If there are mo no moves, we create an um, error message. Let's give that a try and see how well that works. X, oh, the computer moved right away, and it took the first cell that was available. Let's move here, and the computer chose the next cell that was available. And the computer chose the next cell, and it turns out I win. This is not a very smart algorithm for playing tic tac toe. Again, I won again. In fact, it's hard to allow the computer to win. You really have to. You really have to try hard not to win when you're playing uh, tic tac toe with this very rudimentary logic. Let's just see if I can not win. No, it's really hard not to win. And again, trying hard not to win. There we go. That's time we I let the computer win. It's even harder to create a cats game. One way that we can attempt to give the computer more intelligence is to actually check to see if the computer might win on its next move. Let's create a method called might win. What we can do is rather than trying to figure out all the possible ways that we might win, what if instead we tried the next possible move and then saw if we won? That would be pretty easy and it's the way people play the game for in real life. What we can do here is we can say, hey, let's just go ahead and make a move. In fact, we want to make sure that, that cell is empty. What we're going to do is we're going to actually make the move. We're going to put our marker on the board, then we're going to ask the rules if we've won, and then if we have won, we're going to return that row and column. Now, if we haven't won, then we want to make sure that we set the board back the way it was. In a way, what we're doing here is we're allowing the computer to imagine what would happen if it made every move on the board and asking itself, did I win? And if the answer to that question is yes, I did win, then I want to make that move. 
down here instead of get next move, what I'm going to do instead, let win equals might win of me. And if I win, then return the winning move. Okay. And if I don't win, just pick the next cell on the board. Let's give this a try and see how we do. So now I'm going to move in the center square here, which is not a win for me, but with the old logic, it would have, the computer would pick the next move, which would be this square over here. But what it should do now is it should choose, it should choose to win. And it does. Our logic's gotten better. Our game is a little bit smarter than it was last time, but it's still not smart enough to know that I might win. For example, it went over here, but I might win here. The next step in this logic is to say, what if my opponent might win? Okay, and that's the reason why we pass this other in here. Let's try that. Let block equals might win of other. And if there is a blocking move, then return that blocking move. Let's give this a try. Here's my X and my X. Oh, and so it's smarter. It prevented me from winning. Let's try this move. Okay, it sees that I might win horizontally, but there's nothing it can do about my diagonal move. I'm going to try that. Nice. Let's try again. Let's see if we can get it to choose a win over a block. Move here and move here. And now if I put my X in the center square, it could choose to block me right, by putting the O down here, but instead it should choose to win. I'm going to click on the center square where I might have a win. Actually, I'm going to choose on the, this square over here where it might have a win, but it chooses to win instead of block. That's excellent. Now the logic's getting pretty good, but it's still not that bright. I can still pretty much get it to, to, to lose on a regular basis. Now, the game is still actually pretty predictable, right? If it can't win and if it can't block, it just picks the next square. I would like it to be a little more random. Let's try this. And rather than actually making the next move that it finds, let's have it add that move to the list. And then when it returns, instead of returning whatever move it found, it actually returns a random move instead. If there are any moves left to choose from the remainders, then it chooses a random move, and so it's a little less predictable. Let's give that a try. There's my X, and in the old game, it would have put the O to the right of my X because it was the next available slot, but instead it moved randomly. I'm going to move here. It blocks because of the logic that we have to handle blocking. I'm going to block it. It tries to block up there, and then I win. Let's try again. And this time it moved to the right. Not the next, but it moved randomly. I'm going to choose this one, blocks me, this one, and it wins. Now, I would like to give it some logic that is a little better than just random winning. It would be nice if it could, and you can see it's getting smarter, right? It's actually a little harder to win than it was before. Now what I'd like to do is introduce the concept of a book move. Our logic is doing pretty well. If the computer can win, it'll make that move. If the computer can block, it'll make that move. And then if the computer can't do either of those, it makes a random move. And that's not a terrible bit of logic, but it's not very smart. Now in the world of chess masters, there's what's called a book move. Chess masters have studied uh, chess for decades, and over the years, they've actually written books on response to make to an opening move. If you move pawn to king four, then perhaps the best move is to respond with pawn to king four. These book moves are recorded, and chess masters study them. Now, tic tac toe, of course, is a much simpler game, but we can take that same approach to playing tic-tac-toe. The book moves for tic-tac-toe are pretty straightforward. If our opponent places their X 
in a corner, we take the center square. And if our opponent takes the center square, we take a corner. And then if our opponent takes a side square, we also take the, cor the center square. It's almost always that we take the center square as our, our next move. Let's try that. I've created a little function called get book move. We iterate across all the squares, looking to see if any of them are occupied by our opponent. And if there's more than one X on the board, then we know that we're not at the beginning of the game. And so if the number of moves so far is not equal to one, then we know that we're not doing a book opening move. To check to see if we've got the center square, we check to see if the row and the column are both set to one. If the first move is in the center, then we're going to respond with the upper left-hand corner. Okay, that works. And now as X, I can go to the side or I can go to the corner. And the best I can do as X is take a draw. So this is boring, right? It's always playing the same move. I would really like it if it chose um, one of the other corners as well. What I'm going to do instead is that I want to accumulate a list of possible moves. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to make an array called responses. And rather than return a value, I'm going to add that response, that possible move to the list of responses. And I'm going to return the responses. And then down here, I'm going to make this book moves. And if book moves length is not equal to zero, I'm going to return book moves. Let's give that a try and see how that works. Okay. We haven't broken anything. And I was doing a pretty good job of winning. Now let's see what happens when we add the other four corners to our responses list. And rather than return book move sub zero, we're going to return a random book. Now when we go to the center square, see it chose a corner, but it was a different corner than the last one. It's doing pretty well. It's choosing a different corner each time. And then it falls back on the logic that we gave it earlier, which is uh, to, to take a win if you can, and if you can't win, to prevent a win. And it's actually doing a pretty good job here when we choose the center square. Now, let's suppose that we choose something other than the center square, like the corner. Now we're back to our random logic. And in this case, it's just not going to do as well. If the user opens up with a corner square, we want to take the center square. And again, where we're doing is we're giving the, all the possible responses. And it turns out that in this case, it's always the same response. It will return one comma one four times and choosing randomly from that list is always going to be one comma one. If I choose this corner, it goes to the center, choose that corner, goes to the center, choose this corner, goes to the center, that corner goes to the center, always choosing the center if I choose a corner. And if I choose a corner and it goes to the center, from there, it's almost guaranteed to be a draw, unless I make a mistake, whoops, unless I make a mistake and allow O to win. Yeah, and so there's a classic winning move for X. And once again, if uh, we play in one of the side squares, or we want the computer to play the center square. A side square would be at uh, 0, 1. Okay. Now we always go for the center square. Let's give this a try. I go to the side, chooses the 0, or chooses the center. And pretty much it's going to be a cat's game. There's not much I can do once O has chosen the center square. Now, one thing I wanted to share, if we've gotten to this point, and you notice there's a lot of repetition here, these rules look all very much the same. And it would not take much 
to tr- create a a table or a data set of these rules. Let's try that. What we have here is a list of if-thens. If the row and the column are one value, then I want my response row and my response column to be the next value. Okay. Now that changes this logic, right? Instead of a whole bunch of if then statements, I can now iterate across my book moves. Now these book moves are constrained to data. And now that they're data, in theory, we could throw these book moves into uh, a data file and edit them. Let's see how this did. Everything should work the same as before. It's exactly the same logic. If we move in the center, O goes to the corner, and there's pretty much not much we can do from there. Now, mind you, the logic here isn't perfect. There's still the problem of choosing the second move to make sure that X doesn't get an upper hand. And even though the opening move is the right opening move, occasionally O will pick the wrong second move. And that's an exercise left to the viewer. There is one thing that's left that's just a little annoying And that is that the computer really doesn't seem to be thinking very hard about its move. And that's a little annoying. It would be nice if the computer were thinking at least as hard as I were thinking about its move. Let's add this. Let's add a timer. And when it's the computer's move, we can say, we can set the message. And then we can check to see if the timer has expired. If it hasn't expired, we'll just return. It's basically going to think for one second. Let's try this now. Okay. It's thinking. There we go. Thinking. There we go. Thinking. Very good. That's a little bit better. One last thing. It does appear that if we click on the board while it's thinking, that's our next move. I think what I'm going to do is I'm also going to close out or cancel the uh, board's move just so that any errant clicks on the board do not become so click. But yeah, so it's not going to accept my clicks until it actually makes its move. Mm-hmm.